All right. After a, a nice break and a lunch and a more conversations about halibut, we're back. <laughs> and um, so um, this afternoon, uh, we do have a, a few more reports to hear. Uh, first off, we're going to hear from uh, Joseph around the five-year biological and ecosystem science research program. And Robin's going to provide us, uh, I think, a short update around Pisces. And then after that, we'll be doing the scientific uh, re hearing from Sean Cox on the scientific review board. And then finally, David, you're going to provide us the uh, research advisory board report that uh, will take us through the afternoon and then we'll provide an opportunity for public comment and questions. Yes, go ahead, Linda. I'm sorry, could I just ask a question? So I don't know whether you commonly follow Robert's rules or loosely. I know we were loose with it at the conference board, but um, so I had made a motion and we said we were going to wordsmith. Um, do we have that sort of table to a time certain? Do we know when we're coming back to that? Or could you just tell me sort of the status of where we are with that motion? Gosh, I was hoping you were going to tell me. <laughs> um, yeah, we were going to come back to it, Linda, for sure. Um, now, do we actually have it drafted up and circulated? Um, I did draft it and send it to David, and I also uh, I typed it, sent it to David, and also gave it to Jay. Um, I, I just wondering when we're circling back doesn't need to be now, but no. Um, so tomorrow morning, what are we doing then? Thursday morning. We're going to hear at 9 o'clock. Uh, we'll be back in the Arbutus room at that point in time. We'll hear from the um, report of the 87th session of the IPHC conference board, right? So maybe before we start that, Linda, we could uh, go back to the motion you made. So we'll do it first thing tomorrow? Tomorrow morning. Okay, thank okay. you. Jim? We're trying to make it as hard as we can for the chairman, but after all this time, I, I still have trouble recalling which of the four categories the various documents are in. So can, can you help me find where this file is? Um, the one for uh, Joseph's is, uh, at least in the diligent board books, it's uh, report number 11. And it's titled Five-Year Biological and Ecosystem Science Research. Got that? Yeah. Way to go, Bob. <laughs> Took me a while too. I had to ask Joseph. That's the only. I mean, that's why it was, it was making me look smart. Um, so, if you're okay, go go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Over to you, Joseph. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, with this presentation, I intend to provide you with a description of the research activities that we plan uh, to perform at IPHC for the next five years, as well as with the description of the projects that are. A proposed for fiscal year 2017 and also including the external uh, projects that we've uh, submitted to uh, external funding agencies as well. So the primary uh, objectives of the, the research program at IPHC uh, are first to identify and address the critical knowledge gaps in the biology of the Pacific halibut, uh, second to understand the influence of environmental conditions on halibut biology and to apply the resulting knowledge to reduce uncertainty in current stock assessment models. Uh, our goals are really to understand uh, uh, alterations or changes in biomass and specifically in spawning stop biomass, also uh, changes in recruitment uh, and uh, obviously including uh, how reproductive potential or reproductive output affects recruitment and also in turn how recruits uh, will eventually contribute to the spawning stock uh, biomass. Um, of course this uh, uh, is, uh, the studies are uh, um, conducted um, keeping in mind that there's also uh, other forces operating on the biomass of the halibut stock uh, such as the fishing intensity, predation, etc. And therefore our studies are intended to provide answers to some of these questions. Uh, you will see that uh, there were a few studies uh, on migration, uh, also uh, several studies re related to growth that affect both the biomass of the adults as well as recruits. Uh, obviously studies on reproduction, 
uh, and also studies uh, related to discard mortality rates and survival. So the five uh, uh, primary research areas uh, that I will be describing are this five uh, in order reproduction, growth, uh, DMRs, and post release survival assessment, migration, and lastly, genetics and genomics. And this research areas are intended to um, to uh, answer or to provide information on, on management, uh, specifically on the sex ratio of the catch, uh, to improve maturation estimates of the spawning stop biomass, uh, to understand changes in size of age and changes therefore in biomass, uh, to provide tools to assess fish condition, to update our estimates of bycatch survival, to understand larval dispersal as well as adult feeding and reproductive migrations and to also understand the genetic structure of the population and to provide genomic tools uh, to perform these studies basically to understand and describe the genome of the species. The first uh, area on reproduction uh, uh, proposes several studies that uh, intend to fill in the knowledge gaps on the reproductive biology of the species. Uh, and what we think is needed is knowledge on reproductive development, uh, maturation, fecundity, uh, sex determination mechanisms, which will provide us information on the genetic basis of sex, environmental and hormonal control of reproduction. Uh, secondly, to provide scientific-based criteria to identify reproductive status and reproductive potential, and to update our estimates of age and size and maturation, and also to provide information on skip spawning. Therefore, the new proposed studies in this area are first to fully characterize the annual reproductive cycle of the species and to identify sex determination mechanisms and their influencing factors. The first study has the objective to understand uh, temporal changes in reproductive development throughout an entire annual reproductive cycle in male and female uh, Pacific halibut. And we will start uh, by performing histological assessment of gonadal development and maturation. Uh, and in fact, there has been already a study that has been conducted this year uh, comparing the ovarian development between females caught in the winter during the reproductive season and from samples collected from females uh, during the summer during the non-reproductive season and we've already identified differences in ovarian development that could improve our maturation schedule of the species. In fact, this study has been described in detail in chapter 5.6 of the 2016 RARA. Uh, in addition to this histological studies, uh, we intend to perform uh, endocrine profiling of the reproductive cycle by measuring reproductive hormone levels in the blood. Also by um, performing genetic pressure or transcriptome profiling of the reproductive axis to identify those genes that are responsible for gonadal development, to measure gonadosomatic index throughout the reproductive cycle, and also to monitor gonadal development and maturation uh, with the use of ultrasound technology. Uh, this study uh, has been proposed as an internal project for fiscal year 2017. So with this a series of studies we intend to provide uh, information on the reproductive biology of the species in order to improve our estimate of actual spawning biomass. Also to improve our staging of reproductive status, to update uh, estimates of maturity of, at age, and also to provide estimates of skip spawning in the species. And uh, these uh, studies are conducted uh, um, uh, with uh, Tim Lohr and myself from the IPSC staff. The second uh, study uh, on reproduction, which is the identification of sex determination mechanisms, has the objective to understand how sex is established in the Pacific halibut. Uh, first is through the identification of genetic sex markers. Uh, and these are genetic markers that will allow us to genetically tell males from females with the use of single nucleotide polymorphism polymorphisms, uh, usually referred to as SNPs, and also to use this molecular or genetic sex markers to validate the coast-wide sex marking projects that we're undertaking this year. Uh, and uh, I will make another reference of this project uh, later on. Uh, you can find um, accurate descriptions of these uh, two projects in chapters 2.9 and 5.5 of the 2016 RARA, respectively.
Uh, in addition to the identification of genetic sex markers, uh, we also plan to identify the mechanisms by which sex is determined and, and its onset during early development. Uh, and also to identify uh, potential environmental influences, mostly in the form of temperature, on sex determination. And this is important in the face of changing t temperature or thermal regimes, as uh, has been was shown yesterday or the day before by Ian uh, when um, the PDO uh, was referred to. Uh, so there are cool and warm periods that may actually have an influence on sex determination. So one of the uh, studies that we plan on doing is to evaluate possible consequences of temperature on sex ratios at the population level. With these studies, we intend to provide genetic sex markers through this SNP assays to identify the genetic basis for sex and to provide information on possible environmental effects on sex ratios. Uh, some of these studies are um, proposed as internal projects for fiscal year 2017, and they're uh, conducted in collaboration with uh, scientists at the University of Washington, and also from the French uh, National Institute of uh, Agricultural Research, the INRA. Uh, and uh, Tim Lohr and myself are involved in this project. Moving on to growth, uh, the studies that are proposed are really uh, intended to fill in information on factors that influence growth in the species. What we think is needed is improved knowledge on growth patterns and environmental influences, uh, and improved understanding in the possible growth, role of growth alterations in the observed decrease in size at age. The proposed studies that we uh, plan on performing our extent uh, our first to provide a catalog of physiological markers to monitor growth in the wild and secondly to evaluate growth patterns and effects of environmental influences the first study uh, has the objective to identify and validate molecular growth for growth studies with this we'll plan on identify express sequences from skeletal muscle right and skeletal muscle as well as liver and to develop molecular assays to quantify gene expression of growth markers in relevant tissues. Uh, this is done through uh, RNA sequencing. Uh, this is an ongoing project that has already allowed us to identify, in fact, tens of thousands of express sequences or transcripts in this growth-related tissues uh, that um, uh, have allowed us to already uh, provide a pretty good indication of potential markers. And in this table, I'm just showing you a list of potential growth marker genes in the Pacific halibut that represent a series of processes that uh, uh, could be of interest uh, for monitoring growth in the wild, such as genes related to growth regulation or genes related to energy metabolism or genes related to muscle activity. Uh, the, the results of this uh, uh, preliminary studies uh, have been summarized and described in Chapter 5.7 of the 2016 so we, with these studies, we intend to establish a growth-related gene sequence data set uh, and to provide molecular assays to monitor growth patterns in the wild. The second uh, study that we propose related to growth is to evaluate growth patterns and the effects of environmental influences on growth uh, with the objective to identify molecular, biochemical, and isotopic profiles that are characteristic of specific growth patterns and to evaluate the potential effects of environmental influences on growth. Uh, first, we plan on evaluating the different growth trajectories in the wild, and uh, we have collected in the, in the 2016 Bering Sea NIMS trawl survey, uh, we have collected muscle samples from fish at different uh, size categories, and uh, we intend to characterize uh, molecular and biochemical growth markers in liver and muscle samples from age-matched uh, individuals uh, that hopefully will represent different growth patterns. Uh, but also, we are establishing uh, different growth trajectories in juvenile fish in captivity to identify this molecular and biochemical signatures of growth patterns. And um, one of the ways that we will we're, we're do that is to subject them to feeding and fasting regimes, but uh, more importantly, uh, by manipulating their growth rates, either by uh, changing their, their food ration or altering the density or uh, using temperature or fasting to 
uh, induce growth uh, compensation. Uh, some of these studies, especially, specifically the ones related to temperature, are already underway in collaboration with the Alaska Fishery Science Center in Newport, Oregon. And uh, there we are growing juvenile halibut that were caught off the uh, island of Kodiak. In July 2017, this fish, these juveniles have been intact individually. You can see that in one of the pictures. And after eight weeks at two different temperatures, at two and nine degrees centigrade, we already have seen a significant difference in their specific growth rate. Uh, so there's a clear effect of temperature on growth. And now we have samples from this uh, two different uh, temperatures uh, to uh, identify specific genes that are regulated by temperature that are related to growth. Um, we also plan on um, studying isotopic tissue turnover to trace dietary and or habitat shifts uh, through the use of stable isotopes, uh, carbon-13 or nitrogen-15, and this will be performed in collaboration with experts at the Alaska Pacific University in Anchorage. Um, we also plan on investigating the effects of environmental factors on growth performance. In addition to temperature, we plan on also uh, looking at the effects of salinity, of dissolved oxygen and water pH on growth, and importantly, to identify the optimal environmental conditions for growth. We also plan on understanding the basis of the sexual dimorphic growth in the Pacific halibut, basically understanding why females grow uh, larger than males. And with these studies, we intend to identify and validate uh, growth markers for field studies. Secondly, to characterize molecular and biochemical growth signatures uh, to understand what are the effects of the environment on somatic growth, and basically to provide improved biological inputs on biomass estimates. Uh, some of these studies have also been proposed internally uh, for this uh, fiscal year 2017, and they've also been part of a large uh, grant that has been submitted to MPRB on growth. And these are the staff that are involved in this project. The third aspect uh, related to our research activities is uh, discount mortality rates and survival. And the proposed studies are really to fill in uh, our little information on the factors that influence survival of fish uh, when they're caught. Uh, what we think is needed is to introduce uh, quantitative measurable factors that are linked to fish handling practices and to fish physiological condition and ultimately to survival in order to improve our current uh, DMR estimations. So the new proposed studies are the following. First, uh, to evaluate the effects of fish handling practices on injury levels and the physiological condition of captured Pacific halibut. Uh, second, to investigate the relationship between physiological condition post-capture and survival as assessed by the use of accelerometer attacks. And lastly, to improve our estimates of survival of Pacific halibut caught in the trawl fishery. The first study uh, has the objective to understand the relationship between handling practices and physiological condition of captured Pacific halibut in the long line fishery. We plan to assess injuries associated with release techniques, for example, ganglion cut, careful shake, hook straightening, and to determine the physiological condition of all captured fish with their associated injury levels after different deck exposure times, and measure a series of parameters that include condition factor indices, energy levels, morphometric analysis, etc. And lastly, to measure the effects of, uh, I'm sorry, the levels of stress and physiological dis disturbance indicators in the blood of all captured fish in the form of cortisol levels as a stress hormone, lactate, and glucose as metabolites, potassium, and the hematocrit as well. And with these studies, what we provide, what we expect to provide is, is an injury profile for the different release techniques in the long line fishery and to provide a physiological assessment of fish handling practices, uh, basically to provide a fish condition index post capture. The second study uh, has the objective to measure survival post-release in Pacific halibut and link this with the physiological condition and capture-related events. So we plan to tag fish that have been exposed to different handling practices in the long-line fishery with accelerometer tags, uh, in addition to conventional tags, the, the wire tags that we usually do. 
Uh, and secondly, to assess survival of fish according to size and physiological condition. And with these studies, we intend to provide information on post-release survival in relation to handling practices and physiological condition. And secondly, to provide information on post-release survival in relation to size. Okay, so we intend to provide a link between handling events, physiological condition, and eventual survival. Okay. Importantly, we also uh, will try to estimate DMRs by uh, electronic monitoring uh, and by linking directly uh, hook release techniques, uh, hopefully with survival. Uh, this studies, uh, some of these studies have been proposed internally, uh, as well as uh, in a large uh, external grant that has been submitted uh, in December 2016 to the Cellcom Stahl Kennedy uh, Research Program. And these are the staff that are involved in these projects. Okay. And lastly, uh, we improved we intend to improve estimates of survival of Pacific halibut in the trawl fishery. Uh, the objective is to assess the condition and the survival rate of discarded Pacific halibut in the non-directed trawl fishery and to improve our current estimates of discard mortality rates. Uh, we intend specifically to continue and capitalize contacts with the industry, for example, the Amendment 80 fleet, to plan collaborative research on discard survival, uh, to apply methods to assess physiological condition in captured halibut, uh, to determine survival rates of discarded halibut after tagging, uh, to relate physiological condition with survival rates of discarded halibut. And with this, we intend to improve our knowledge of survival of discarded halibut and consequently to improve the estimates of discard mortality rates in the trawl fishery. All right. this is the, these are the staff that are involved in this uh, project. Moving on to migration, um, what we think uh, we need to do is to improve our understanding on larval, uh, juvenile, and reproductive migrations, and importantly, to incorporate additional sources of biological information on migration. So the new proposed studies are to move towards a more integrative view on migration, to focus our efforts on larval migration and connectivity, and also to perform uh, studies on swimming and migratory performance. The first aspect, moving towards a more integrative view of migration, uh, has the objective really to combine current tagging efforts with other methods to assess migration, specifically genetic anopheles and tissue composition analysis. So we intend to perform genetic analysis of tagged fish to shed light on migration patterns and geographic origin, to perform autolith, microchemical and stable isotope analysis and tissue stable isotope analysis, and also to perform reproductive mo monitoring of the uh, satellite tag adult females uh, by looking at blood endocrine reproductive parameters, the levels of blood hormones, uh, to take out ovarian tissue biopsies to determine exactly the stage at which these females that are tagged and released are found, and to perform ultrasound also to confirm the ovarian staging. So with these studies, what we intend to do is to provide genetic and elemental and isotopic information on migratory adult fish, uh, to improve knowledge on reproductive migrations and identification of spawning areas. Uh, two of the projects that are proposed this year, um, one is uh, to tag uh, reproductive females in the Bowers Reach in the 4B area to identify spawning grounds in, those, in that area, and uh, secondly, to uh, use photographic imaging of the tails to explore the possibility that this could be a valid method to uh, identify fish uh, as an alternative to tagging. So this is a pilot study that is proposed uh, this year uh, um, as one of the projects for fiscal year 2017. And these are the staff uh, involved in these projects. Larval migration and connectivity has the objective to understand the mechanisms of larval connectivity between the Gulf of Alaska and the Bering Sea. And uh, we intend to collect data from the NIMS uh, Ithioplankton Survey and to map larval distribution over time and space, uh, to collect larval samples from the survey to, con to conduct also uh, genetic analysis. And these are some of the diagrams that uh, we have generated uh, to um, map the abundance of larva and their size uh, based on the uh, NIMS uh, Ithioplankton Survey. Uh, these studies uh, have been proposed as a, a NPRB grant uh, this year in collaboration with scientists at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center in Seattle, mostly Janet Duffy and Esther uh, Goldstein. Uh, 
Um, and with these studies, we intend to improve knowledge on larval distribution, migration, and genetic structure within the population. Uh, there was a request by the commissioners in one of our last meetings to provide further information on this project, and uh, Lori Sodorus can uh, show a few slides if requested at the end of my presentation on this matter. Lastly, um, the genetics and genomics, the studies that we propose are uh, intended to provide obviously the genetic uh, information on the genetic structure and population and to evaluate uh, the genome of the species. Uh, what we think is, need, is needed is, is improved knowledge on the genetic composition of the population to establish your genomic resources for the species and to perform genome-wide association st studies to evaluate the genetic effects of fishery-dependent and fishery-independent influences on growth, reproduction, nutrition, and other processes. The proposed studies are the following. First is to continue our studies on population genetics and secondly to sequence the Pacific halibut genome. Uh, the first study, population genetics, has the objective to characterize genetically the Pacific halibut throughout its distribution range. Um, and this has been done in the past, as you know, through other techniques such as microsatellites, but uh, now with uh, novel techniques such as rat sequencing and SNP analysis, uh, there's much improved resolution to this type of analysis. Um, and hopefully uh, this will lead to the identification of genetic signatures of geographical population groups throughout the range of the species. This is an internal project that is uh, proposed uh, for 2017 uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, scientists at the University of Washington. And these are the staff involved in this project. Uh, secondly, and, 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 and this is one of my first one of my last slides on the research program is to sequence the Pacific halibut genome. The objective is to obtain a first draft sequence of the Pacific halibut genome. This has tremendous implications, uh, not just for the biology, or, but also for management. It, it, would, it will provide genomic resolution to the genetic markers that are being generated by our projects, mostly SNPs or transcripts. Uh, it will provide identification of genomic regions and, and genes that are responsible for temporal and spatial adaptive characteristics of Pacific halibut. Uh, will allow us to perform genome-wide association studies to try to understand the genetic basis of growth, reproductive performance, migratory behavior and performance, et cetera, and to link the genotype of the species with the phenotype. Uh, this is also an internal project that has been proposed for 2017 and collaboration with the uh, French Institute of uh, Agricultural Research. This is a chart of activities throughout the uh, next uh, five years um, um, by the different um, proposals. The projects related to reproduction, some have started and some will start in 2017, uh, particularly the annual reproductive cycle. We have the projects on genetics and genomics that uh, some have started already and will be sequentially starting uh, in 2017 and 18 and 19. Projects on growth, uh, some have started already uh, and uh, will be uh, an important contribution to the research activities throughout this next five years. Uh, work on DMRs and survival will start hopefully this year in 2017. And the work on migration, which has been one of the landmarks of our research program, uh, is, al is already started, but uh, we'll start some novel studies also in 2017. Uh, this is a, just a list of the uh, new and continuing projects that uh, you have in the report. Um, it indicates uh, the, the different uh, projects with the, the principal investigator and the management implications of the different projects. And in this following slide, you can see a little bit of the interaction between these uh, different projects and, and how they relate all to our uh, management. Uh, requirements. Uh, I would like to highlight this project, the Sex Marking at Sea, uh, because uh, Tim Lower has been presenting it to the uh, PAG as well as the conference board uh, because there's uh, a request for voluntary participation in our coast-wide uh, study this year. Um, there's always, there's, there has all, also been a request from our research advisory board to address the issue of chalky halibut. This is uh, was not contemplated initially, but 
In fact, with all the markers uh, for growth that uh, we're developing, we could actually um, incorporate this analysis if required. Um, as you may know, Chucky Hollywood is a condition that uh, has been attributed to changes in pH, uh, to changes in protein degradation in the muscle, um, has been related to stress, has been related to eye storage, uh, and, uh, but th there's no clear indication as to what are the real causes for Chucky Hallett, but uh, I just want to bring it uh, because this is, um, this is an important issue for the industry as well, and we could possibly address it. Um, this is a list of the external proposals that have been submitted in 2016 for external funding, and we're uh, waiting for a decision sometime in the spring of this year. The first one uh, is a project uh, that has been submitted to the Salton Stahl Kennedy uh, program, uh, and it's entitled Improving Discord Mortality Rate Estimates in the Pacific Hollywood by Integrating Handling Practices, Physiological Condition, and Post-Release Survival. Uh, the second is a project on growth uh, that has been submitted to MPRB. Uh, the third one is a project also submitted to MPRB on larval transport. And finally, a small grant uh, to the Essential Fish Habitat Program in collaboration with uh, the Alaska Fisheries Science Center and Newport uh, on, on growth in not only in Pacific halibut but also in yellow tooth uh, flounder. Uh, and this is a list of the uh, special research projects that are um, being contemplated uh, within our survey. So we have collaborations with uh, agencies such as NOAA, uh, DFO, um, uh, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, Alaska Department of uh, Fish and Game, uh, Alaska Department of Environmental Conservation, and even the Seattle Aquarium and a variety of, uh, of projects uh, for which we collect samples for. And um, I will take some questions uh, if you have. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joseph. I think you mentioned back on slide 17 that uh, this was on the migration studies that uh, Lori may have some additional. Yes. Okay, so um, this is a cooperative project with NOAA, as uh, Joseph just was talking about. This grant was submitted uh, to NPRB in December, and uh, I don't think we'll know anything until spring or summer. Um, the first step will be to synthesize the data from 1972 to 2015. They are actually... Um, that's underway right now. I'm working on that, and they will be using it to, to uh, parameterize a model. They're only going to be using 1991 to 2015 for that model because that's when the um, that's when the surveys became um, uh, regular. Um, they are fo we are focusing on the Western Gulf of Alaska and the Bering Sea. How do you Thank you. So the justification here is. To provide additional inputs to the MSC process, um, spatial ranges and ecosystem use for early life history, um, to help close the loop of Pacific halibut life history, and to provide insight into the potential effects of how management choices in each basin may affect the other basin. Uh, the hypothesis is that the eastern Bering Sea is a repository for both Bering Sea and Gulf of Alaska eggs and larvae. And this has been speculated a lot in IPHC reports in the past, all the way back to the 1930s, actually. Um, transport models have now become adequately sophisticated to achieve this. And the, um, we don't have the modeling uh, expertise on our staff, but that's what the Alaska Fisheries Science Center will be doing. So this is a map of the larval, larval sampling stations over all the years. So this doesn't show where halibut was caught. It just shows the range of their stations, which range from all the way uh, in southeast and up into the Chukchi Sea. And then this is zeroing in on the western gulf and the Bering Sea. And this shows, you can see Unimac Pass, um, where the larvae were were found on either end. They have stations kind of across one side or the other, but um, the, uh, the tides right in, in the pass itself are, are pretty wicked, so they don't get a lot of samples right there. But you can see that there are, um, 
there are larvae found kind of all over the place and then sort of spilling into the Bering Sea. And in the summertime, the, the, um, the larvae are taken kind of around the corner and up into Bristol Bay in some cases. And then in the wintertime, the larvae are kind of jetted out across the, across the, um, the break there that you can see. So. Um, this is just one more map of larval occurrence by staging, and so the colors are hard to see, but basically you're seeing that the smaller larvae are found further offshore, and the uh, larger larvae are found, or older larvae are found um, further inshore, and then kind of on the other side of that uh, Unimac Pass sort of spit out area. And so one of the things we'll be doing too is looking at not just uh, a synthesis of, the, of all the data, but also looking to see if there are differences between um, years. So I um, might be looking at PDOs, so the cool and the warm phases, um, things like that. Also looking at uh, halibut are pretty invisible between here and about two years old when they start to show up in the, in the surveys again, the nymph straw surveys. And so we've kind of, they're... Um, the next indication we have of them is as two-year-olds. And so we have, um, I don't have them here, but we have kind of looked at where those two-year-olds start appearing, which is in northern Bristol Bay and that, uh, that inside ridge right there. So that's all I have. All right, thanks very much, Laurie. Let's see if any questions uh, on the report. Jim. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is fabulous, thank you. I, I was taking a note when you showed the first of the larval uh, things. Can, can you back up to that one? This, uh, farther back. Yeah. yeah. So, so if I could, Mr. Chairman, uh, the, the NPRB grant is going to look at larval exchange perhaps through Unimac Pass. Have you, and is the fact that there's uh, not much larval information here for 2B and 2C, partly because you didn't look, you didn't have as many samples there, or do you, is this kind of your understanding that this is where the density of, of larvae is? Uh, this is actually sort of being driven by work that NOAA is already undertaking with other species, and so they're looking at pollock and cod through Unimac Pass, and they have found that their models, they have been able to parameterize their models to show this happening, and so they wanted to um, find another species, uh, the, a flatfish preferably, and they thought halibut, so they contacted us. Um, they're, uh, we're zeroing on the western gulf because that's where their models are built from. They, I, I'm not sure what their models look like in the east at this point. So would, if I could, Mr. Chairman, is there a chance that the study could, could or could in another stage try to discover whether there's any any larval input from 2B and 2C into 3A, for example. Uh, that's something I'm also interested in, uh, but probably won't show up here because that's where the NOAA, the fishery service study was set up. Right, yeah, the, um, right now there are no plans to do that, but this is just at the very beginning phases, and be the beginning phases of their own studies as well on pollock and cod. And uh, we do want to add a genetic component to it. We consider doing that this time. They do have 93 biological samples of larvae as well to try and try and pinpoint where they're being spawned, for example. But um, Joseph could probably speak better to that. Uh, he did some consults with some geneticists, and um, everybody kind of decided that was a little premature at this point. Bob? So uh, reading the grid down there. So the ones that are in red, that means that there's been at least uh, 12 samples taken? On, uh, yes. It's not necessarily density, it's, it's the number of samples. Right. Taken. So over the, over the course of, of all years that they've done the survey, it's been sampled that many times. Their survey moves around depending on funding and that sort of thing. Uh, Linda? Thank you. Maybe a question for Lori and then one for Joseph. But um, but so I'm reading this that it's year sampled per grid cell. That's not. Sh so is that saying anything about how much larval there? It's just how many samples. No, the other. One. This is yeah. This is just uh, just where the sample was taken. This yes. has nothing. Yeah. This doesn't tell anything about larvae at all. Okay. All right. Good. I 
thought maybe I was misreading. Right. Um, no, this uh, is a clarification. This is the slide where right. you would infer abundance of larva collected in those sites. Yeah, and there, so there aren't slides that show whether there were any larval abundance found in the other parts of the Gulf because the models only look at this part. Okay. We actually do have maps that um, take in the whole Gulf, but that's not where our study area for this particular study is, so I didn't include it here. I got it. Okay. Then, Joseph, I could ask you a very basic study it's a question. Um, I don't understand how an accelerometer tag works and how, if you could explain to me how it works and how that's going to get you information on um, release mortality in the fixed gear fishery, that would be really helpful. Right. I'll try to answer. I think Tim is, is probably our expert on um, satellite tags and accelerometer tags, but I can briefly describe it. Is a is a tag that uh, records whether the fish is actually moving or not. Because uh, the tag records whether there's a tilt in the, in, in the tag as the fish is moving. So a tilt in the tag, and Tim, correct me if I'm wrong. So it's basically a recorder of movement uh, with the assumption that a fish that is moving is alive, whether the fish that is not moving is dead. Okay. So, um, and that tag, you only get that information if the tag's recovered, or is it? Correct. And okay. the tag is released after a preset number of days. It released and comes to the surface, and then you can recover it? Is that? Yes. Yes. There are two different uh, richnesses, and I, like I said, I've got some PowerPoint slides if people want to see them, but there are two different sort of richnesses of the data. The data in the tag is recorded at 30-second intervals, and so you can get all of that if you get the tag back, and we have them parameterized to count those tilt percentages and knockdowns over two-hour periods so that when they pop up and broadcast, it'll give you a record of, of all of the fish movement and lack of movement over that time period. Okay. So, so, so they're designed for studies in which you don't get the fish back. Um, yeah, mine's different too. Um, so it's more general, I guess, and, I, and kind of reading ahead, I was taking a look at the, um, at the uh, scientific review report. And um, I mean, and clearly what you presented here this afternoon, Josep has a, has a very comprehensive research program that's looking at biological and ecosystem impacts. And um, uh, so a lot of good work uh, to be undertaken and uh, looking forward to the results as you know they come in over the time frame you identified but I did notice in the in the uh, in the scientific review report and was, there was a question about linkages back to MSC and modeling and <clears throat> about the potential for there to be you know two work streams and how the two are linked and so I thought while you're here I'd take advantage of asking you what you thought about uh, the linkages between the two Right. Now that that's uh, it's an important point, uh, Chairman. Uh, that was, as you said, raised by the SRB, and and in fact the uh, the quantitative scientists and the research uh, program have worked uh, together quite closely on identifying specific areas that are important for management, and that's one of the key um, drivers for the biological research. Uh, perhaps the better example of the research that is, was presented here is the project on DMRs, uh, where, where uh, there was a proposal that was uh, put together in, in conjunction uh, with the uh, quantitative scientists. Um, and that's probably the first example of, of our effort towards working closely uh, between the research group and the quantitative scientists stock assessment and and uh, and also um, uh, yeah stock assessment yeah thank you um, Bob yeah I was just going to say with the information we got from the Amendment 80 fleet the potential savings that they have they're producing is quite significant so it becomes really important to know degree that, that that's 
stuff is surviving and, and coming back to us so that we have it may not be one to one obviously so I, I applaud you on that but I on the sex marking um, uh, I would just encourage your port samplers to contact the local fishing organizations um, um, maybe get the boat try to get the boats to dedicate one trip to that uh, this year uh, I think they would respond but they they need your guys to ask and, and to uh, let it be known what you, you want there. I think that uh, you'd get a positive response from the different ports. Um, I know uh, Jeff Steffens would make his place available and the North Pacific Vessel Owners and Homer and there's a number of, of organizations, Alpha Petersburg Vessel Owners, ours in Seattle, so I just encourage you to contact those people before the season starts to let them know what you, you would like. No, thank you very much for the suggestion. We'll do that. Linda? Let's follow up to that. It might be um, helpful to uh, give reasons for what, succinct reasons why you want the information and then um, clear guidance on how to differentiate. There's a lot of fishermen who know how to tell males from females, but some who I've talked to have said, I don't think I've ever seen a male, maybe 2C. They don't see many, um, or they may just be missing it. I know I don't see many um, in my fishing, but um, I think it would be important to provide that kind of information. Thank you. I'll just add on that that in 2B where we did sort of an area-wide spin-up on this with the help of uh, PHMA and Chris Borer was instrumental. Uh, we did put out a fleet handout that does have how to tell a male from a female on the front side and what the markings are on the back side. So that will also be available this year. And there were printouts upstairs outside of conference board. I think they might have all been taken by now, but I've also got the PDF. I can give it to people and, and reprint more if we need it. All right, well, thanks very much. Thank you. Um, next, we're going to hear from Robin around Pisces. Well, thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm Robin Brown. I'm the executive secretary of Pisces. Pisces is the North Pacific Marine Science Organization, which has the name Pisces for complicated reasons that we don't have enough time to explain. It just is. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Yeah, yes. Okay. Um, so this is the kind of mission statement from Pisces that comes out of our strategic plan that I have copies of for anybody who's interested in those things. So the key words are its scientists, uh, transdisciplinary, so we're talking climatologists, physical oceanographers, contaminants people, people who work on lower trophic levels, fisheries scientists, um, and increasingly uh, people who work on socioeconomic aspects of this. So this is a new area for us. Um, multinational, six countries, and we'll get to that later. Um, ecological and social resilience, those are key words. Words you don't see here. Regional fisheries management organization, you don't see management. It is a science organization, not a management organization. So this is who we are. We're formed in 1992, so we just celebrated 25 years the start of 25 years of operation. Um, the purpose is in the convention. Six countries, Canada, Japan, China, Korea, Russia, and the United States. ISIS is an organization, a bit like the Halibut Commission. It's got a governing council composed of national delegates which provide oversight and a relatively light hand at the helm. Um, as a secretariat, as the commission has to manage the day-to-day -day activities, that's where I work. It has a science board that sets the scientific priorities, and for this kind of organization, the science board really leads the organization and where we go. 
Um, and underneath the science board, there's a whole group of various kinds of expert groups with various kinds of names to oversee and actually do work. So there's scientific and technical committees, working groups. There's a taxonomy of smaller groups of people set out to do various things. Pisces has this 10-year integrated science program called FUTURE, which is aimed at forecasting and understanding what's going on in the North Pacific uh, with the idea that we might even be able to predict or at least prevent ourselves from being very badly surprised. So Pisces and the Halibut Commission have history. Um, going back to the early days of Pisces, Pisces identified the Halibut Commission on a short list of most relevant organizations for partnership and collaboration. Um, in the 1990s, uh, the commission, mostly led by Steve Hare, was very involved in some of the science uh, working groups and symposia around climate change, climate variation, regime shifts, and the impacts on fish and fisheries, including halibut. And what came out of this work was uh, uh, understanding that if you looked across the North Pacific, the things you saw in any one area in any one fishery made a whole lot more sense if you have this larger context. So here's some of the history of things that we have done together. You will see that most of these things result in um, special issues with multiple scientific papers in one of the common peer-reviewed journals. That's kind of one of the things that Pisces likes to do. Uh, more history. Some of these things show up in Pisces in-house scientific reports. These tend to be longer things than you can get published in the primary literature. And the Halibut Commission did provide data for the North Pacific Ecosystem Status Report in the first version, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Halibut Commission has co-sponsored with other organizations that we partner with, particularly ICES, FAO, Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, on some larger scale things where we're attracting a global audience to talk about some of the issues that in general affect you. So uh, these are some of the uh, symposia and large conferences uh, that we, we have worked on together. Uh, I'll go back, back up here. Uh, we did sign a memorandum of understanding with the Halibut Commission and I'd say participation and collaboration declined after we did that. <laughs> uh, from our point of view, these aren't important things, but it gave me the opportunity to think about, well, should we come back and should we be talking together about what is it we can do together? So what do the opportunities look like for the Halibut Commission to work with us? Well, co-sponsoring symposia and sessions, that's one of the things that we like to do. We run these things. We like to get lots of partners to help share the costs and increase the audience. So we're already working on the fourth international symposium on the effects of climate change on the world's ocean for 2018. It will be in Washington, D.C. It will attract about 400 to 500 people. It's something we do joint with ICES, so it's a global effort. Contributing your data and analyses to the North Pacific Ecosystem Status Report, I think is kind of a slam dunk. You can gain from the bigger picture. We can gain because the Halibut Commission has some of the best fisheries data and the longest time series of what's going on. Um, so that seems obvious and real low cost. Um, the Commission could choose to participate in some Pisces summer schools. We run some of these ourselves. We do some in conjunction with other people. There's a couple coming up, advanced survey approaches, coastal ocean observing systems. You can have a look and see which things are attractive to you. 
And the Halibut Commission can always request ex officio status on any relevant Pisces expert groups. Pisces has got a convention, but people who have named positions on committees have to be representatives appointed by their country. Um, but we acknowledge that there's a role for people from complementary organizations. So it's a matter of thinking about what it is that works for you. So thinking about expert groups that you might be interested in having somebody on. Pisces and ICES have a joint expert group on climate change and marine ecosystems. And this, is, uh, this brings complementary expertise in ICES and Pisces together. Pisces is stronger in uh, oceanography and circulation modeling, some of the kinds of things we saw just a little bit earlier. Uh, this has been quite successful. Uh, we have a working group that is at work now on the next round of the North Pacific Ecosystem Status Report. We're spending some time and effort, painful uh, at times, to try and devise a system where producing these ecosystem status reports will require less work uh, and provide more time for analysis and interpretation and less time spent sweeping the data together. So this is something that I think the Commission ought to be interested in. In, in the lighter font, there are some th other things that Pisces do that I doubt that you're interested in. I doubt that you're interested in invasive species. You may be interested in some of the socioeconomic uh, stuff, effect of community on communities of climate change and redistribution of marine resources. That may be something you're more interested in. Um, the working group on ecosystem reference points, I suspect that's something you're interested in. Uh, we've got another working group on climate and ecosystem predictability that's fairly heavy in the physics and lower trophic level parts of the ecosystem, but you know, ecosystem predictability is the holy grail, um, and this group seeks it. So, if I was going to give you advice, or make recommend recommendations, I think uh, Pisces and the Commission ought to review the opportunity space for collaboration. And based on that review, we could consider refreshing the MOU if this is necessary. I don't think it's necessary from our perspective. But if an MOU is something that allows our organizations to work effectively together, then it might be time to have a look at it. And that's all I've got to say. All right. Thanks very much, Robin. Any questions for Robin? Linda. Thank you, Robin. Can you tell me, with some of these items that you listed, like IPHC contributing data to the North Pacific Ecosystem Report, are those things we did in the past? The those are things did, you did in the past. And not doing now? Or you some did. doing, some not doing? So my assessment of the relationship is it's kind of fallen apart. Okay. Um, and not for any reason, probably just neglect, turnover of people. Steve Hare was deeply involved in this line of research and contributing. That was a thing that was very important to Pisces. And probably it's inattention on both parties' part. That's one follow-up question. Um, and on the, the expert working groups that you talked about, are those people, I mean, if, if we were to have someone on there, is that a staff person? Is that a commission person, an industry person? What, what um, just depends on it the is a, They are scientific working groups. But beyond that, if there are people who have something to bring to the table to those working groups, um, we're pretty agnostic on what affiliations they might have. Pisces is an unusual organization in that the composition of people in expert groups is some academic and some government, and the ratios vary in the different countries. But we don't really care where you come from. We care what you bring. Okay, thank you. All right. 
Um, I've never heard it explained that way before, Robin. But <laughs> <laughs> um, any other questions for Robin? Robin, uh, so what I'm hearing from you, oh, here's a, here's a show, my ignorance. Um, ecosystem reference points, I can imagine what they are, but why don't you tell me? So as people worry about the stability and resilience of ecosystems um, and whether they can venture into alternate states uh, and particularly alternate states that are not favorable for your species of interest. Um, as they develop the theory on that, then the challenge is, well, how would we know where we are on the continuum to being in one of these undesirable places? And that's kind of where ecosystem reference points are aimed. Um, and it's been a real challenge. And but again, it's one of these holy grail activities, and there are some signs that there may be value in going down this road. It's very interesting to see how the people in Asian countries think about these things. They have different kinds of data, they have different species, they have a different way of thinking about it, and it's uh, broadening to do this with them. Thanks very much, Robin. Um, I mean, you did pose a question at the end about, you know, re reviewing opportunities for collaboration and maybe through an MOU. Um, I think maybe we'll have some further discussion on that and and, uh, and uh, see where that takes us. Okay. But I uh, appreciate getting that update and uh, explaining what Pisces does and how the IPHC could fit in. Um, the next report we have is from, I believe, Sean Cox, who's going to give us uh, the report from the Scientific Review Board. Thank you. Uh, in my haste to get this into the template, I forgot to put the names of the SRB members on there. So it's me, Sean Cox, I'm from Simon Fraser University, Jimmy and Ellie from NIMFS and Mark Mangle from the University of California. So I'm just going to give you the key points here in our two reports that we submitted this year from our two meetings, one in June, one in September. The, the June meeting, as, as we've come to experience it, is um, more of a research type meeting where we have kind of open-ended discussions about uh, things that staff are interested in pursuing and some of the ideas uh, that we throw around in there. And then and the September meeting is, is about uh, seeing progress on that research as well as um, getting more specific about how the assessment is done that particular year, how the advice is presented, and so on. So starting with the, uh, the June meeting, just some highlights here. So we, we talked quite a bit about the, the space-time model. Um, Sounds a little Star Trek-y, but uh, so we, we suggested using the geostatistical approach as a, as a name to be a bit more accurate. But um, the pros of this kind of approach is that it gives you more consistent accounting for spatial and temporal patterns that are fairly persistent over space and time. So it can, it can keep track of things like uh, biomass hotspots uh, that, that persist over multiple years. Uh, it's also not as sensitive to localized year effects where you tend to get really high catch rates in some areas just um, just by chance. And so it tends to smooth those things out a bit. Uh, it eliminates some of the ad hoc adjustments that are made to extrapolate to non-surveyed areas and things like that. Uh, and it uses the local data in any kind of extrapolations. So you can see that in, I think in this year when there is some extrapolation to, for instance, the Salish Sea, uh, it wasn't using the overall area to be average to, to estimate what a CPUE would be in that region. It was actually using uh, data, data closer from 2A and uh, southern area of 2B. So it, it makes a lot of sense that way. Um, there are cons to this kind of approach. Uh, one, obviously, is that it's a model. Um, so it's, and this particular model is quite complex, so it's hard to communicate. 
Um, it's very expensive to build, maintain, and, and manage a model like that. Uh, you need highly specialized uh, knowledge and training to be able to um, to do that. It it also uh, what you see as WPU values that go into the assessment are actually model predictions and not necessarily raw data like uh, like you may be used to seeing. So it, there's there's some challenges that way. Um, so I. I I heard Paul mention this, um, things about the what we talked about in the biological and ecosystem program. We're, we're really encouraged by what's going on for genetic methods for sexing fish. Um, that's really needed for the assessment. It would be a major improvement. Um, understanding the spawning behavior and growth, uh, those kinds of things, uh, particularly if, if growth and spawning uh, maturation are related to climate, those things would be important. Uh, for the management strategy evaluation in particular. Uh, they, they may not be as relevant to the tactical uh, you know, assessment model that's done every year, but certainly for the MSE work, they, those things could be important. And of course, estimating the discard mortality rates is something that, um, that is really key to, uh, to the whole assessment. And I, uh, Paul's point was that we, we you know, wanted to make a comment to make sure that the work is consistently aligned with the assessment and, uh, and the MSE work. The, um, for a stock assessment modeling, we talked a lot in the summer about the spatial assessment model and we were looking at some of uh, what Ian was doing, putting together a draft spatial model that we had asked for. Um, this is for looking at the implications of movement and Movement can be complex. It can involve sex, age, regional differences in movement rates, uh, selectivity may be um, complete, area dependent, and so on. So this spatial assessment model is, again, something that would be important for an MSE, certainly given the, um, given the issues in Pacific Halibut with uh, the large spatial area. Uh, a spatial model is going to be important for the management strategy work. Um, so that's basically what I just said. Um, at this point, it's uh, it's a bit too uncertain to use a spatial model as a tactical tool for setting annual TACs. Now, in our September meeting this year, we pretty much followed up on those same topics. Uh, we looked at the updated uh, space-time model results. We had some discussion about that. Uh, there was an issue about how to calculate the survey timing adjustment, particularly in 2A. And so that led us into a discussion about, you know, about eBio and whether eBio is actually even needed. And so we, we had some discussion and recommended dropping the, um, the eBio, um, phasing it out and going to uh, just putting area specific harvest rates in the calculations where eBio uh, would have been involved. Um, we, we spent quite a bit of time reviewing the sources of, of mortality, um, the, the different components of, of discarding and retention and so on. And in particular, uh, Ian made some big strides in how to communicate those, that whole process um, to, the, to the members. So we were really encouraged by that. Um, and then we we had some time to talk further about the spatial model and one of the big issues was what we suggested was to decide what kind of data this spatial model needs to fit well and what kind of data maybe uh, it doesn't have to be held to such a standard. So the annual assessment model, the, the tactical model that's used to, to derive TAC advice, uh, that has to fit pretty much all of the data. And it generally does a good job at that. But when you go to a spatial model, there's always going to be things that you can't capture in the model. And so there's, um, there's going to be some data sources that it's not going to fit well, and there's going to be some that it, it would. So I think that's the next step in the spatial model. And there are other examples of using these kind of benchmark data criteria um, in, in developing complex models. 
and um, Alan basically just taking over uh, on the management strategy evaluation side. So um, we were encouraged to see progress uh, in setting objectives and getting everybody together and, and um, getting organized and working on objectives because that's really essential to how the scientific work for the MSE will be set up. It's, it's all going to depend on, on the objectives and uh, how those are laid out. And that's, that's our report. Thanks very much. Any questions for Sean? Linda. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have two questions on the space time model, and I'll see if I can be clear. What I'm, I'm trying to understand the con part that you talked about, about the model or, or weight pre-unit effort used in the assessment is model predictions, not data. And I, I understand there's also a smoothing function. Um, so does that mean if, uh, say, you were um, taking samples in an area or survey sites in an area and one survey site was way higher than survey sites around it or the only survey site in that area but didn't match what you'd seen in other years, that instead of using that high number, the model would smooth it out or use what it would project to be there instead of the actual number from weight per unit effort from that survey site? It, it will use that number, but it will, uh, it will smooth it both in relation to what's going on around it. So if this one data point, let's say it was surrounded by four others, and it was really, it was say 50% higher than the previous year, whereas the others remained at the average, that would tend to discount some of that increase. It'll drop it, and it'll adjust it downward to be similar to what's around it in that year. Mm -hmm. But if the year before, let's say the year before it was also up relative to its surroundings, then it's going to also average across there too, which would pull it back up a little bit to say, well, maybe there's something more persistent about this location. And it does this, and the, the weighting is, isn't arbitrary. It's usually done, um, you know, in, in places where the data are more variable, then there's more room to to smooth, whereas if the data are more precise and more consistent from year to year, then those don't move as much. So it, that that's that's what makes sense about the, the approach is is some sites are just going to be inherently variable and random, and then the sites around it are more consistent indicators of what's going on there than uh, than that site. Uh, yeah, I see that. I just I. I mean, I know halibut can be very patchy, and you can have a site that's very hot and never not hot again for a while because the fish are somewhere else. And so I'm just wondering how that, over time. And that's what, that's what this approach should be good at capturing to some degree, yeah. Uh -huh. Because it, those local effects should persist over time. That's the, that's the time aspect, is that if a place is, tends to be higher than the ones around it, over time, yep. then that that'll take that into account, right? And lower. It's Whereas it, both ways. Yeah, exactly. And if it tends to be similar to everything around it, but one year it's high, then you know it will say, well, over time, all these places have, have acted the same, so it's going to bring it down. Yeah. And you see that there's a fairly large correction, and I think it was the early part of the time series. So it's a fairly large correction. Mm -hmm. that was driven by uh, this, this spatial temporal things. Right. Thank you. I did have one other, one other question, if I could, on a different topic. Um, when you were talking about the space timing adjustment and getting rid of eBio, there was also a bullet there of use recent estimated area-specific harvest rates. So is that referring to the 21.5 and the 15? Or is it what was the realized harvest rate? I didn't quite understand yeah. what the context of that was. No, in my, my notes I meant to say the target harvest rate because the target harvest rate is independent of all the calculations. So that, that was a typo on, on my part there. I meant to say target. Okay. So in that sense it would be the 16 and the 21 and a half and so on. Okay. Yes, Jim, go ahead. So I was with you right up until you said target harvest rates are independent of any calculations. 
I, I understand they're independent of the calculations in the space-time model, but hopefully there's some calculations. So go and just <laughs> <laughs> well, where did the 21 and a half percent target come from? That, that, that's those are the ones we were, we were talking about. Um, I had a couple of questions. Let's see if I can formulate them. So one is on eBio and uh, the recommend, recommendation to uh, remove it from our memories. Um, but I'm wondering, though, I guess, uh, to what to replace it with Exposure. And so earlier this in the morning, we were having a discussion around that type of uh, what's our, our replacement for eBio, I suppose, would be another way of looking at the motion that you were talking about, Linda, I think, about, you know, um, how do we develop some stock distributions by either regulatory area or some more <coughs> uh, geographical area, and um, which would potentially help to um, provide some guidance, I would say, around um, allocation and what would be appropriate to harvest in an area. You, so the specific question is? The specific question is, do you have some ideas around if you, removing oh. eBio and we're still looking for having some ideas around stock distribution by area, what, how would one go about doing that? <laughs> well, I mean, that's the aim of the apportionment. It's the closest thing would be to, to look at the distribution, assuming that catchability is the same across the grid. Um, that's that's the idea behind apportionment. Um, the thing with that is the the population selected by the survey might be different than the population selected by the fishery. And I think that's where eBio came in because that involved some, a common fishery selectivity, um, which is one of its one of its drawbacks. Um, yeah, I, I, that's the nearest thing I can. I mean, it's done. It's done elsewhere. It's done for, uh, I believe, sable fish in Alaska. Kind of look at the distribution of CPV across the, that area. It's the nearest practical thing. That's based on you know it's close to the data. Um, Did you have a comment? just triggered a, a question in my mind. I mean, so right now the survey um, that we use for apportionment is 032 even as we move to an SPR because 032 is what's taken in the fishery, right? Mm -hmm. um, but eBio is, well, I guess so that's the question is how do we get at what you're not apportioning because there's this part of the stock and how do we talk about it? It's not the apportion part if it's not being selected by the gear. So we need some terminology, I guess, to talk about, think about what's going on with the stock as a whole. Um, and I'm not expecting to have an answer now, but maybe it's something. Well, I think it's definitely a topic that we could we could sit down with at our June meeting and, and try to deliberately come up with something that makes sense, I think. Yeah, that would be good. Um, we had talked about um, giving the MSAB some direction around this, and that's one of the reasons I was raising it here now. Um, my other question, um, I think, is simpler, but it goes back to so. the <laughs> goes back to the space-time uh, modeling work. And as you know, um, there's a, also a proposal, and we're embarked upon it to increase the number of uh, stations. Um, both within areas, but also to add on to areas further south, for example, and further north. And so um, thinking about the work, and we heard a good presentation from Ray earlier this week on Monday about um, how the, all the work that's gone into developing that space-time model starts to lead, I was starting to wonder about, you know, how important is adding more stations when you can now have some ways of uh, filling in some of the gaps and thinking about how often you really need to have stations uh, all the time. We already have a large number of stations uh, covering a large geographical area, 
and um, the other part of that that triggered some of my thinking about this in conversation was, well, we add more stations and <clears throat> we're going to have some impact on some species that we don't really want to impact. Mm -hmm. um, yellow eye rockfish is one example, both in not just BC but Washington, where somewhere on the order of, I don't know, 3,000 tons are currently, I think, impacted by the set line survey, and I think it's 2B. So if you start to double the, the amount to, you know, five tons is not insignificant in we're asking commercial and recreational to make substantive changes to their um, particular fisheries. Um, and we've done that over two years and there'll be a third year coming in. So it starts to think about the impact of, you know, gathering the scientific information. So that was a long question. <laughs> Well, that was, you know, it's a, it's a really valuable one to ask, and I think, you know, if, if I would have thought of it before, I would have put it in the benefits of having a model. You know, it's one of the things that a model, you can experiment with it and say, well, what, what would happen if we didn't go into these high yellow eye spots and, and maybe use the, the CPUE depth relationship to forecast? And it's not like you have no information. You have samples nearby, and you have if you have good con contrast in your depth CPUE data, then you should have a good idea, um, you know, if, if that site, say, has a slightly different depth than the ones around it, then you can correct for the depth CPUE as well. So it's, it's something you can definitely do some experiments on, and I would, you know, Ray was showing us some of the uh, estimates of how far apart stations need to be before they essentially are, are independent of each other. And I think, dep depending on the area, but uh, you know, roughly 30 nautical miles, I think, was about, was common. I mean, there were a couple of places where it was smaller, but so it, it could be that you could thin it out in some areas or maybe not thin it out for every year, but not every, you don't have to go into those places every year because they're very similar to the ones around it. So that, that would be a, a probably a really good avenue to pursue, I think, research-wise with that model. All right. Um, thanks very much, John, for Thank the you. report. Thank you. Um, we, uh, Dave, you're going to provide the report on the research advisory board, I think. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I will be necessarily brief. Uh, as um, most of you would know, the Research Advisory Board is quite an informal body that discusses the various research projects being undertaken by the IPHC uh, and also to suggest some uh, additional potentially applied research projects that we may wish to incorporate within the research program. The RAB met once in uh, 2016. Um, unfortunately, we only had seven members uh, in attendance. Uh, four were absent, and I think we're suffering a, a similar fate, as it were, as the, the MSAB has accounted in the recent past. And so we certainly need to go through uh, a recruitment process you know, in, in accordance with the rules of procedure uh, over the coming while. As I said, the, the core mandate of the Research Advisory Board uh, is to suggest research ideas to the IPHC staff, uh, review the core research programs, uh, particularly as we are, as you've just seen, uh, JOSEP's uh, five-year research program, and provide the staff with uh, direct input and advice direct from industry uh, on those research plans. There is also an element uh, for the RAB to provide recommendations to the SRV, uh, which hasn't at the moment really been utilized to any great extent. 
there were four core recommendations uh, from the RAB in 2016, uh, and these have been considered uh, and are shown um, on the screen in terms of what the, the interim meeting, the commissioners uh, put forward at the interim meeting. The first on the survey expansion, which was uh, a recommendation that the staff develop uh, a detailed information paper associated with the survey expansion. Uh, the Commission tentatively recommended that this uh, take place and for that uh, information paper to be provided by the Commissioner's work meeting in September of this year uh, and we'll be undertaking that task as part of the work program. The RAB has also recommended that uh, best practice um, bycatch handling practices be developed or guidelines be developed. Uh, and again, this has uh, now been incorporated into our program of work uh, and will occur throughout 2017. The RAB also uh, put forward the recommendation regarding the IPSC closed area, uh, and I recall that that was a question uh, from um, the US side uh, regarding who proposed the original closed area, if there was any industry uh, put that forward and so this is where that recommendation comes from. That's detailed in Proposal B and will be considered again um, I believe on Thursday and Friday. And then finally regarding Chalky Halibut, uh, Josep uh, pointed that out in detail in terms of what the RAB had put forward and that has potentially been incorporated into the five-year research program which is paper 11 and as Josep presented it so that's there for a potential endorsement. Uh, and that's it for the RAB. It's a very short and uh, succinct report. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Dave. Uh, questions for Dave on, the, on RAB? Yeah, go ahead. Then. Thank you. Um, Dave, I, I believe in the past minutes from this meeting have not been made public, is that right? They are available on the website, but as with um, many things on the website, uh, they're quite discreet and have been difficult to find. But yes, they have been made available. Thank you. And they were sent out this time, or something was handled differently about the minutes, is that right? Um, I, maybe someone else could advise me. It's, it was my first meeting as well, maybe Steve. This meeting we produced a report in the format that uh, you're becoming familiar with, the way we reported the interim meeting and we posted it rather quickly. In the past, the RAB report has been a document that the staff wrote up and presented to you at the annual meeting. And it's always been in the annual meeting, uh, <coughs> meeting documents. I see. Thank you. Um, Dave, the uh, report you're talking about going back to, I think, developing the information paper, that's kind of was getting along the lines, I think, what I was asking. Do you have a, a, an outline of what you proposed there at this point? No. Uh, due to the worth staff being preoccupied with the presentation or development of materials for this meeting, we haven't commenced that. Um, I'd make a recommendation that it would be good to see um, an outline of that paper and see if we could comment on it before the work's undertaken. Jim? The original intention, sorry, through the chair, the original intention was that this was to do with the, the scheduled periodic uh, expansions, not the ad hoc uh, expansions. Thank you. All right, thanks very much, Dave. Um, I'm just going to see if there's any questions online. No? Does anyone in the room have any questions for any of the presentations they've heard this afternoon? If not, um, we'll take a break. Uh, I understand that FAS Seafoods has supplied a, a tray of their products for our enjoyment. Right, They're over. They also, some of you may know, have provided a variety of products. And they're, I think, over by the coffee station. FAS.
finest at sea. <laughs> That's a, a local company here in Victoria. It's right across the harbor. Yeah. Processor. Oh, okay. Processor, fishermen, sable fish, and halibut quota. Yeah. So we'll get back together at 20 after.